Thank you for joining A Bridge Between Us. This is the third of five online conversations organized by the Foundation for Self-Leadership. They represent our modest attempt to stop or at least to slow down the seemingly uncontrollable downward slide toward a widening and deepening societal chasm. Our people and communities are stuck, dear participants, on separate sides of a growing divide, especially in the US. Too close to the cliff, dug in, holding with clenched fists onto rigid viewpoints, making harsh judgments about each other, calling each other names from across the way, throwing labels at each other without knowing the other or even attempting to. And as you know, labels squeeze us into tiny boxes and push us into tight corners, so tiny and so tight that our survival instincts kick in and get agitated. And we become adamant, demanding respect, acknowledgement, validation. We insist on being seen and noticed for the inherent worth and richness of who we are. We're so different as people, and yet maybe we complement and complete each other. We're so different, and yet one might wonder, are we the same at the very core of our own humanity? We lose sight of that when understandably we face behaviors, language, decisions that are offensive shocking, frightening, and dangerous. The reality of a divided society is not unique to our times. Maybe today it feels a bit more pressing, precarious, intense. What have we learned from our previous experiences and why haven't we learned? Are we so close together that without understanding the, each other's differences, we feel that our identities are being threatened and crushed. You know, the world as we know it has perhaps changed. And we wonder what's at the core of this new reality. Is it fear acting out? Unspoken, hidden fear of losing what's familiar or comfortable, losing status and power, or the illusion thereof, a frightening fear of losing our basic rights and freedoms. And mind you, many among us have not fully enjoyed these rights and freedoms. A terrifying fear that we might lose or see the experiment of democracy fail. Is this reality only external or is it also a manifestation? of what's brewing inside of us, calling out for attention and care. Just think of life's challenges and traumas, burdens carried by families and cultures across generations. What I believe is at the core of this growing tension and turmoil is a fight for power, to gain it or to keep it. A desire to protect privileges inherited through families, culture, or biology a desire or a need even to uphold core principles and high ideals, which we should, and a responsibility to honor identities that may have inadvertently defined us. So what's identity after all? It's certainly not monosyllabic. We attach ourselves to and identify and affiliate with a set of norms and values and we expect the world and its institutional systems to judge us accordingly. Yet sadly, we are often judged by a limiting set of thoughts, views, traits, or characteristics. Political, religious, ethnic, racial, gender, sexual, professional, social. This generates pain that lingers and that is passed on when unaddressed. There is pain behind and because of the struggle for power, privilege, and the preservation of identity. 
We're all in pain, dear friends, looking for healing, looking for hope. There's pain when we're angry and lashing out or perhaps even because of it. So the question is, how do we become aware of these issues around identity? How do we address them? And how do we start the healing process? This fellow bridge builders is the context for today's conversation. The impact of isms on identity from self-awareness to healing and action. And I'm very pleased to be introducing our two panelists today. Rahul Sharma is a strategic inclusion consultant he is a clinical psychologist in private practice. Rahul is a former professor and chair at the uh, Illinois School of Professional Psychology. Rahul brings deep and proven experience and expertise in multiculturalism and diversity in emotional intelligence, leadership, and wellness. For those of you who attended the IFS conference when it used to be held in Chicago, mm -hmm. would remember Rahul and his award-winning group Funka Daisy. Uh, I think you'll hear, you'll get to sample really his talents in a few moments. Rahul, thank you so much for being with us. It's a great And pleasure. Rakina Barnes. Thank you, Rahul. And Rakina Barnes, who we're very pleased to have as a member on our foundation board. Rakina is an IFS certified therapist in Massachusetts, a college adjunct professor. Uh, Rakina has served multiple times as a program assistant on IFS trainings, and is currently in an accelerated train the trainer program. Rakina is also an officer with Black Therapist Rock. Thank you again. It's lovely to have you, Rakina. And before both of you take it away, uh, I'd like to just share one word of housekeeping. Please use the Q&A feature for questions. The panelists will do all they can to address them. Thank you for being with us, Rahul and Rakina. Please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Tofik, uh, for that wonderful context set up and introduction. And uh, Rakina and I are, are so excited to engage in a dialogue and um, share a couple of viewpoints from our experiences and, and also interact with you. Um, but by way of getting started, uh, she and I were discussing setting the tone. <clears throat> and in a way quite literally setting the tone. So what we would like to invite you to do in the beginning is we're gonna do uh, a, what they call mindfulness activity. I'd like to even decolonize that phrase and talk about uh, this idea of, um, there's many cultures that have done this for centuries. Um, mm -hmm. Relaxation, breathing techniques, part of deep system. So I think of the yogic system from India, pranayam, which is uh, a, you know various types of breathing techniques. But we just wanted to set the tone, and with your indulgence, I'll uh, play this Indian stringed instrument, uh, not as performance, but just really as a tone setter. And I'm going to lead you through a quick visualization. Uh, invite you all to shut your eyes as we. Each of us listening and participating set our intentions on what we're doing in the next little bit. So allow yourself to breathe deeply and slowly. And just notice where your breath is happening. Some people notice it in their nostrils, might be in your chest, might be in your diaphragm. Mm -hmm. No need to really even change it at all. Just notice. And as you do this, find a rhythm of breathing that feels natural and feels right for you. And as you continue to breathe deeply and slowly, we invite you the same way that you look at the night sky and you're looking at the stars, there's just pure appreciation. There's no desire or need to change the stars or the constellations as you see them. You're just looking with a sense of appreciation. We invite you to notice your inner constellations. 
Whatever is going on for you inside, we invite you to look with a stance of just appreciation. And as we focus on our topics for today, the impact of isms on identity, I want you to notice when you think of racism, what reactions does that stir up for you inside? Might be anger, might be shame, might be rage, curiosity, despair, anything. Can you non-judgmentally catalog and just notice what's going on for you when you think about that? And we can look at other isms, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism. Do an internal check. How do those land for you? Do you feel them anywhere in your body? And is there any desire to do anything with these reactions that you have? Maybe choose one or two of these reactions and reflect on, is there any movement you'd like with that? Is there any transformation you'd like for that? And just stay with it, breathe with it, breathe through it if you need to. We'll take one more minute to have you reflect on that before we come out of this. and taking as much time as you need. When you're ready to come back, you can open your eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Raul, for that beautiful, beautiful meditation and opening. As we be begin today, hi, everyone. We can't see you, but I'm glad everybody's here with us today um, to talk about this topic. Um, but before we get started, we're actually going to use some questions just to kind of start the conversation and for Raul and I to really start to dive into this topic of isms. Um, and identity and self-awareness. And so the first question, um, as you're kind of just getting aware of your parts that might've come up through the meditation and just allowing them to come into the room as they are um, and know that activation might happen throughout our conversation, um, which is okay. As long as you, you know, just take care of yourself. So the first question we're gonna get started with um, is my identity. What makes me me? So I'll start um, with this question. And for me, um, as people can see, I'm a woman of color. And so that is a big part of my identity because it's not something that I get to choose, right? I'm very proud of who I am. I'm a black woman. Um, I also have Central American um, in my blood. And another identity for me that I'm very proud of is I'm a mother. I have three children that I'm very proud of. Um, and it's not an ism that I think I get labeled with, but sometimes I feel like when I tell people the ages of my children, because they range from 25 to three, um, there's always a reaction and then a follow-up question, like curiosity, how old I am. Um, so I think sometimes there's judgment placed on me around that, or that's how my parts feel. The other identity that I was thinking of as we were preparing for this is the identity that I come from a lineage of African ancestry and how that I get, I'm going to use the word proud. I'm proud to come from 
a lineage where I can say my ancestors were African. I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am a healer, I'm a social worker, I'm a teacher. I can go on and on with the list. But the reason why I chose these identities is because these are the identities that are important to me and make me who I am. And as we're starting this conversation, just to introduce myself a little bit to everyone in the audience and who's listening and tuning in virtually today, who I am. So I will start with that and I will pass it over to you, Raul. Thank you so much uh, for that. And as I move through these um, questions and, and, and we start to unpack uh, aspects of today's topic, wanted to also start with uh, a little bit about my background and because I think the story of my identity kind of dovetails into how I look at my work. Uh, I'm the youngest of four in my family and uh, I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I identify as Indian American. My ethnic heritage traces back to the north of India and Punjab. However, my two older sisters and my parents were all born in Nairobi, Kenya. So here I was growing up in Kalamazoo, Michigan in the Midwest, but coming from a double migration family history uh, from India to Kenya, Kenya to Kalamazoo. And I think my early interest in identity and the complexity about the stories of our identities and also, you know, as Taufik was saying earlier, what you know, sometimes the unintended aspects of, of how you are perceived um, or what comes along with those identities. Uh, those are things I started to reflect on uh, and wasn't able to really fully articulate all the aspects of, of, of what's happening here uh, until much later. So through my journey, I uh, in undergrad, I started doing a lot of work on men addressing everyday sexism, sexual harassment, violence against women in particular, what are men's roles in addressing issues of sexual assault. And it was during that process that I also started to reflect more deeply on what does it mean for me to be a person of color, to be growing up in a world where if we talked about race, it was often talked as a black or white issue. Well, here I am as a brown person and I'm trying to find my place in the world and, and all those layers of, of identity, what they mean. So the stories of our identities, acknowledging the role of power and privilege and, and what are the implications? And also as you know, this theme of looking at not just one aspect of identity. If I look at myself as a racial being, I can think about my oppressed status. If I think about the male aspect of my identity, uh, I'm looking at being belonging to a privileged group. Um, so how do I navigate all of that? And uh, I want to also state some beliefs that I have, you know, coming out of this. You'll, you'll hear this, I think, in, in, in some of the points that I'm making. I really believe we've been fed uh, a script that doesn't serve us well. It serves some people well, but it doesn't serve the idea of healing and change very well. And the script is gender is a problem for women. Race is a problem for people of color, right? Uh, uh, transphobia is, is an issue for anybody who is not cisgendered. And I think putting my sort of uh, uh, position on this and making it clear, I think we need to flip that. We, you know, it, people of color, women, you know, people of lower SES backgrounds have been doing a lot of the emotional labor, heavy lifting and suffering on, uh, you know, the consequences of these unjust systems. And the way these systems work is that those of us that have privileges can afford to feel comfortable. And also we're kind of taught, you know, not taught that there's even a dividing line. We might convince ourselves that like, no, this is my, my experience is the universal experience. So right out the gate, I, I feel like it's important for us to, to actively uh, flip that script. Um, and also, you know, the, as part of our title, we're talking about um, self-awareness, healing, and action. 
I do spend a lot of time thinking about what is this process and what's the work that folks with privilege, what is the work that, that, that they, we have to do. Also, if we belong to statuses where we are oppressed, right? It's important for us to be able to claim and to realize we deserve rest, joy, healing, uh, protection from harm. So what does that process of healing look like for us? Um, sometimes people think about this term of, of microaggressions. Uh, the, the, it's been a bu big buzzword lately. People have been talking about it. And if you look at the history of the American psychologist and when uh, Daryl Dwing Sue and others started uh, talking about microaggressions, the way I put it, the field of the psychology kind of lost its mind uh, in response to, to that. This idea of like, what do we do with it, this concept of microaggressions? I think what's really important is this idea that we're used to defending intentions and saying, well, I didn't mean that. Uh, you might have taken it the wrong way. What, to me, the discourse on microaggressions help us do is, is look at the impact side of the ledger. What happens when somebody experiences, experiences this over and over and over again? What is the impact of that? So... Uh, those are some of the, the, the beliefs that I have uh, starting out the gate. In some of my work, and as, as Taufik mentioned, uh, I, I, I do a lot of strategic consulting. So speaking engagements like this, I'll do coaching and I'll do group trainings for organizations. And no matter where I go, whether it's a school context or, um, you know, an organization of, you know, various industries, I often find myself unpacking these identities um, and using a couple of worksheets because there are two aspects, and there's many aspects, but there's two aspects that come to my mind about when we look at age, when we look at ability status, when we look at race and gender and all of these identities. There's the unique stories of that make us who we are around these identities. And there's this issue of power and privilege. So I believe it's important for us to get in touch with the richness of these stories and at the same time start to unpack and take ownership of ways in which uh, we have uh, aspects of power and privilege. Uh, one part of my journey has been uh, as a teacher. I was teaching for 13 years at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology and I wanted to, to share this um, anecdote long before i joined as a professor there was a professor there dr samela abdullah african-american woman uh recently passed away a couple of years ago and uh but she was supervising she was teaching at the school and one of her students was also a supervisee on a testing case that had to do with the department of children and family services in the chicago area and this younger white female student had said to her at one well she was writing up the report and the question was should this child be returned to this african-american family or, or should it be put into foster care and put into the system and the data was suggesting like this child is ready to go back to their parents this uh student kept saying uh in the recommendations no i think we should put this child into foster care and and when dr abdullah said, you know, where is this coming from? I don't know, you know, I don't see where you're getting this in the data. The student actually said out loud, you know, uh, black people don't make good parents. So out of that response and after Dr. Abdullah uh, um, got over her own sense of shock, she boldly came to the school and said, we can't graduate one student from this school without really checking and having, having them do their homework on their own racial stereotypes. So out of that experience, this class that I've had been privileged to teach about uh, 15 times over the years I was there, uh, called uh, Issues in the Assessment and Treatment of Diverse Populations. The point I'm making about this was I've had the privilege of sitting there with students and have them unpack racial stereotypes that they have of, of people of color and 
take ownership of what's their un, unworked or underworked stuff around that. And there's a lot of good that came out of people doing their homework. And even though that class was about race, what does that process look like for all of us on, you know, like me and my stuff around gender or anybody who, who has uh, issues and stereotypes around, you know, different, different groups. So I can pause right there. There's a lot more I, I, I'd want to say, but I want to check back in with Rakina and, and uh, part of our, our, our plan today was to just kind of uh, riff off each other and, and, um, and uh, share some points. But, but the ownership and accountability was one piece that I really feel is, is important for us to look at. Yes, thank you, Raul. So I was thinking we can go to the next question, which falls right in line with what you just were talking about, some of the isms. Um, and so what isms have impacted me? Um, so this is not just a conversation for Raul and I, but as I was listening, I was also thinking for everyone who's in the virtual audience to think about this, right? What isms um, have impacted you? And so I will say, as far as the isms, the one that's been most present in my journey is racism. Um, and I was actually really fortunate growing up as a child. I grew up in a very diverse community and so racism didn't come to the forefront of my life until I got to grad school. And I went to grad school um, at my MSW and the classrooms were pretty much white women um, and myself. And there was one particular class that was about racism. Um, and I was one of three students in that class. And the other two students of color weren't as vocal, they were more, um, observant to the process. And so as we were going through the semester, there were a lot of microaggressions, but there were also a lot of racist comments made. Um, and as I went through this class, I realized like, oh, this is what I've been told, you know, to be impacted by racism is. And fast forward, um, one of the white females who was a classmate of mine. She was from um, a Southern state and we had another class together and she pulled me aside at the end of our education um, as we were getting ready to graduate. And she said, Rakina, I am so happy I took that racism class because I went into it with a lot of isms and the way that you showed up in the classroom, it really had me think maybe how I was programmed and how I came to believe the thoughts that I have about black people are not true, you know? Um, and she was very emotional about it. And in the moment when it was happening and I was being a student of color, defending my voice, <laughs> you know, defending being visible in a class, even though it was about racism, it's interesting. In, academia, sometimes we're talking about racism, but we're not really talking about it, right? And so it just was a very interesting and powerful experience of someone being able to own, you know, their parts, but also being able to feel comfortable enough or maybe confident enough to come up to me. And it felt like a repair, even though I didn't really feel the rupture was ever going to be repaired, you know? And so as I walked along my journey um, as a social worker in the workforce, sometimes being the only black clinician in a department or in a community agency, or being one of, you know, two or, you know, very minimal, I started to experience racism in the workplace. And when it started happening again, I said, oh, here it comes again, you know. Oh, well, Rakina, you don't have the credential and that's why we can't give you an opportunity, right? Okay. Well, you don't have, right? Even when you have the credentialing, you don't have, you don't have, right? That's how the buck is passed. That's my language, right? There's always a reason for, I'm a black woman. I'm not supposed to be a 
head of anything. Says who? You know? And so I saw the dynamics start to play out in the workplace. And I I kind of got a little confused. My parts got confused because I was thinking, wait a minute, I went to school to be a social worker because I love people. You know, I've had good experiences myself. I want to help other people. And my colleagues are social workers too. They they can really judge me and 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 maybe have parts that don't treat me so friendly and so kind. Social workers do that. You know, so I was having multiple parts come up. The the racism part, the part that was confused, really didn't understand how people can be so cruel or so cold or so dismissive. Um, and then also the the finger pointing started where the labeling started because I've always been vocal about race. I'm proud of who I am and I'm comfortable with talking about race. And I would go into meetings, we would have like case consultations and there would be conversations around families of color and I would get really activated and kind of pause the meeting. And when it was racist remarks or, or, you know, power and privilege in the room, some white supremacy sprinkled in there, some patriarchy sprinkled in there, I would, pause the meetings, I would say, hold on a second. Are we talking about this family like this because we assume they're not supposed to have anything or they're supposed to be a certain way? And I would really be targeted. And this is the whole idea of now I'm a black woman, I'm educated, yes, but now I'm angry, right? That's the label I'm given because I'm passionate and I believe in justice and fairness for people. And so when I hear people being misrepresented and not having a voice in the room, yes, I'm going to speak to it. And so that workplace that was once comfortable for me became very uncomfortable because I said there's a lot of racism going on and nobody wants to talk about it. And when I try to address it, I'm actually disciplined. How did that happen? How did I get disciplined for speaking up? about something that's injustice. And I've seen this a lot of times with my own experience, with clients, I work with clients of color. And this is not blaming, but it's to tell my experience and to say, this is how it was. And it was very disheartening, you know, because when I I went into the field to work with people and then for me to be treated injustice, And I remember I had a situation where I had to go through certain channels and, you know, I had to go through a channel and the woman in leadership was a woman of color. And I felt like that still wasn't it, you know, because I was in a system, right? I was in a system that believed, even though we were serving families, individuals, It did not believe in doing something different. It didn't believe in actually addressing the injustice that was happening. I I was rocking the boat. Like I needed to get out the way, you know? And and I think that was very eye-opening for me in my career because it also made me realize, I always known who I am, but it also made me realize, wow. So I'm helping people and I could be mistreated based off of the color of my skin anywhere, even in a community agency, you know? And so I think from there, it really put me, it pivoted me into doing more work around social justice and talking about racism, particularly with my clients of color. This is a story that is not mine. This is a story that belongs to many people of color in the work world. And so I think having that experience allows me to have these conversations because it's not just racism doesn't just impact you in the moment. It actually impacts you, your body, right? It's, it's a reaction when you get, when you're, you're inflicted by racism, there's a reaction that your body actually has. And so it's deeper than just, oh, you didn't get an opportunity. Oh, that didn't happen for you. Maybe because, no, 
it's deeper than that. And so I wanted to just bring that um, to the conversation, the impact of racism and the impact that a few situations, I mean, I, I have others, but those are the two that really come to mind. Um, and I wanted to share as we're having this conversation. So I will pass it to you, Raul. Thank you, Rakina. I, I really appreciate your, your sharing that. And if, if I could just reflect, I, as I heard you talk about the various reactions, the anger and um, the, the shame and the different things, different reactions, and also the perspective that I'm not alone in this, that you hear this from your clients, you hear this from so many places. I was also resonating with you because what I was mentioning earlier, it feels like another manifestation of that. People don't like feeling uncomfortable if you point something out and if you're just insisting on self-respect, for example. Uh, and when you're in a system that's used to things being a certain way, you kind of will get blamed for just for standing up for yourself or just saying this isn't right. And, and I hope that we all, part of the action piece in, in this conversation is recognizing when that's happening. And especially recognizing when a person who's most palpably affected by the ism, right? In, in, in your case, being a black woman, like, is there somebody in that circle that can recognize that that's happening to you and not put it on you to have to speak up for yourself all the time? These are the kinds of things where I'm, I'm talking about flipping the script uh, is, is once we figure out where we are with this stuff, where we can we recognize it when it's happening in your work system, in your family system, in in your your social circles, and when can we interrupt, disrupt respectfully but assertively? Because when we don't do that, we're we're kind of you know reinflicting harm or allowing harm to continue. Yeah, no, agreed. Agreed. How do we contribute to the manifestation of these isms and how do we kind of fight against it? Yeah, great points. Be Are before you... we go to the next question, sorry, oh. uh, there's a question from uh, one of the attendees. Uh, it says, how much is what we see is influenced by the part we see it through? Are we labeling Others, when we call actions racist, sexist, ageist, et cetera. Would one of you like to take that question? Sure. Yeah. Do you want to go, go Raul, and I'll go follow ahead, up? No, okay, no. yeah, maybe we can both speak to it. I think that's a good question when you think about parts work. It is the part that is responding, and I think it's an and, and based off of your experience, for me, I'm gonna speak for myself. Because I'm in a black body and I'm a black woman, is it a part that's responding? Yes, and I also believe it's more than just a part because it's who I am as a person, right? Like I can't change my costume, right? I can't say I don't wanna be a black woman today. And so for me, it's a part and it's all of me. It's, it's, so I would also say to kind of bring it a step further, it probably has parts of self energy too, because for me as a black woman, my authentic self is me as a black woman. Like if I'm be, if I'm being truthful to who I am. And so because that's authentically who I am, people will always have judgment in me, always right? Regardless of the healing we do, I will always be judged. I may always judge too. I have biases. And so I think for me as a Black woman, it's not so easy for me to just minimize it. And that's not the way I heard the question. But what I'm saying is from my own experience, I can't minimize being a Black woman because that's how I show up because I choose to. That's how the world sees me whether they wanna see me or whether they don't wanna see me. Meaning I can be in a room full of people 
and I could be acknowledged for who I am, or I could be overlooked, or I could speak up about what's, what's, you know, unfair and just, or I could be ignored. So for me, there is a part and it's a big part of my authentic self. So that's the way I would answer that question, Raul. Thank you for that. Yeah, just to resonate with that and talk about it further, I believe, yes, technically it's possible. Could it be a part and could, you know, saying, can we label something when we label something? But let's remember when we're talking about these isms, it's kind of a combination of prejudice plus power. So when we're talking about these isms, we're talking about a system of advantage based on race, a system of advantage based on gender, a system of advantage based on age. It's been my experience as a therapist, as a teacher, that class I was telling you about, and as a human being, it's much more likely that someone that is defending against dealing with ways in which they might participate in racism, sexism, ageism, et cetera, it's more likely that they're going to have parts that are helping them refuse to do the work than it's likely for somebody to, to say, well, they're calling it ageism, they're calling it sexism, but it's not that. And the reason why I make that bold claim is because, again, we live in a society where the default is to, even if we do it unconsciously, the default is to... to to give the white person the benefit of the doubt, to give the male the benefit of the doubt, to give, you know, the higher SES person the benefit of the doubt. And these under, the, these folks who belong to these oppressed groups have palpable experiences that don't get airtime or don't get believed when they're told. So, sure, it, it, it's possible that some, but, but, but in my, in my experience, it's far more likely that the ref that that to minimize and to refuse something that might be racist, sexist, ableist, etc., is it that's more likely than someone falsely claiming these things to happen. So what happens if you instead take a yes? Thank you for uh, SES. I mean socioeconomic status. Thank you for that pop up. Um, what happens if you ask yourself the question: What if it might? What if there might be racism here? What if there might be sexism here? And and to me, I think having that stance of openness is really important. I, I just want to piggyback off of what you just said, Raul, because when we start, we're going to transition to, to another question we have soon. But I think when we start thinking about parts, I love the part that you just said, if we're resistant to it, is that a part? right? And getting curious. And what I found when we start talking about is isms, right, particularly in IFS spaces, being able to look at parts and also isms, because isms are something that people do get inflicted by. Now, is it based on one's own experience? Yes, right? Not every Black woman has the same experience as me, right? But I think it can, there's room for both. There's room for us to talk about parts and there's room for us to talk about isms. And how do we do that without losing sight of healing? Because they're both part of healing at the end of the day, right? Not getting detoured or lost and one's better than the other or one's more important than the other. They're both important. So I just wanted to follow up with that, Raul. All right, next question, please. Thanks, Tofik. All right, Raul, you want to take this one first? Sure, sure. And uh, I just want to own, fess up to the fact that I think uh, when I did my introductory remarks, I kind of went through a lot of these questions. So I'm going to be briefer now. <laughs> so my self-awareness journey, you heard me talk about this. Uh, and I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record. I, I really believe it, when I was in grad school, this was soon after Dick Schwartz uh, came, af, uh, came up with this model. I actually wrote a theory paper on is the, is the internal family systems model helpful 
in conceptualizing multiple identities because I was trying to figure out what does it mean to be someone who holds privilege and oppression at the same time. And what I came up with, and so my self-awareness journey that I'd like to talk about right now is there are parts that we have from experiences. There's parts that are reflective of our socialization. So let me talk about my male status. And and when I first started stumbling into addressing issues of sexism and what does it mean to be a male that in many ways has has the power and privilege... I became aware of the fact that I had these culturally sanctioned parts, for example. They are, when someone first pointed out, you know, you, you, you tend to talk more than the other, you know, than I do, like, if, you know, someone I was in a relationship with at the time, or you, you tend to assume that you're more right than I am. That wasn't jibing with the sense of myself of who I was. I was feeling pretty good about myself. So I kind of dismissed it. And if I went to a group of guys and talked with them about it, we might kind of be in cahoots with each other and be like, yeah, no, she's being extreme or whatever. So I could convince myself that she's, you know, overreacting or whatever. But what was missing in that is this initial flood of shame. I didn't want... I didn't like the shame that I was feeling. And then this is where the culturally sanctioned part comes in and where the power and privilege comes in. I'm kind of in an environment that protects men from feeling that. You kind of can can sort of agree with each other that, oh, she's being too extreme, all of that kind of thing. So I I had to really recognize the fact that I'm being flooded with the shame and that might cause a part that makes me think she's overreacting or um, all of these distortions happening, and it was on me to do the work. And as I'm talking, I'm also reading these wonderful questions that are here. I know that Dick Schwartz, uh, Dick Schwartz and Duran Young talk about legacy burdens, and I don't know if, Rakina, you wanted to talk about that. The, here's a question I'll read out loud. And we love these questions, by the way. We, we, Rakina and I want these, this to be interactive. Could you say that isms are cultural burdens to talk about Parts versus isms. I don't know if isms are are cultural burdens. I think I think isms are are societal imbalances, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an emotional and interpersonal and societal fallout that happens because of these unjust systems. And the fallout, it's for us to sort of name and recognize. And, and I'll just say one thing I've been reflecting on pretty deeply lately is this toxic combination of getting flooded with shame, like I said. So, I, I, man, I don't like how I feel when somebody calls me racist, for example, um, for a white person, right? And then on top of it is this maybe semi-unconscious... I'll be damned if I'm going to make if, if I'm going to allow that person to make me feel that way. And there's a lot of inherent racism in in that second part, right? So how do we interrupt that? How do we disrupt that? These are these are things that that I feel are important. But Rakina, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. I would add to isms. So when I think of cultural burdens or legacy burdens, and I'll, I'll take racism because that's the one that I've been impacted the most by, what it makes me think about is programming. And, and when I say programming, like how we were raised, what was our environment, what values did we get taught, right, beliefs, um, how did, you know, people role model to us how we should treat certain people or speak to certain people. It makes me think there are parts of our programming that play into isms, yes. And that's how the legacy burden gets carried on to the next generation, right? If we're taught or told 
to speak a certain way to people or treat people a certain way or a certain population of people can only work certain jobs or come from certain neighborhoods or socioeconomics. That's programming that influences us. And usually it's not into adulthood if we want to be aware that we can readjust some of that programming so we don't carry on that legacy burden. That's one part. Another part is because I am a black woman, I have ancestors who were slaves. And so is there a legacy burden as far as that, that gets passed on to me unconsciously? Yes. And that's not awareness until I start doing my own healing work or my own research as far as tracing back the trauma of what occurred to my ancestors and how it might be impacting me today and what I can do to heal myself so that my children's children might not have the burden. So I do think that isms show up as legacy burdens because it's part of the programming. And it, a lot of it is unconscious. When, when people have stereotypes or certain isms, then they're not aware in the moment of the impact. Or if they are, they're not aware enough to maybe want to do something different. Doing something different means getting uncomfortable. Doing something different means you turning and looking at yourself and saying, wait a minute, what role did I play in this? Wait a minute, how, how come I believe that way about this population? Who told me that? Where does that come from? It goes back to what you said, Raul, the ownership and the accountability. And it doesn't have to come with shame and blame. It can right. come from a curious place, right? Absolutely. Curious is one of the eight C's that we use in IFS. Yep. Getting curious about that part. Yeah, I, I, I so appreciate that. And I, I have found that the self-blame or the shame just might spike uh, and it'll keep us from doing the work. So using the IFS, you know, like you're saying, the eight C's and all of that, can we identify that that's a part of us that's getting activated and either ask it to step back or work through it so that we can get to the curiosity? Um, I've always, and IFS has really helped me put my finger on this experience of uh, that refusal and inability to or yeah or just refusal to to do this work and and i really think it's this invisible process of of being flooded with shame and having some resentment on how you're feeling especially if you have identities of privilege and you're not used to be you know feeling uncomfortable like that so you're just going to shoot it down but 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 I agree. There there's there's got to be a way to do this without the ex excess of of shame or or feeling terrible about yourself. I I know you have some uh, questions that you planned. There's an interesting question that I want to pose. But you'll decide how and when to answer it if you can. And we're at the 15 minute mark. It says, can you make some distinctions between individual isms and systemic isms, especially in terms of how you might respond? We might respond, but this is something you might want to take up later on. I just want to bring yeah. it up before you. Lose. I wrote back to that. Um, my understanding of the question is, and oftentimes when we think about racism, sexism, all of these things, oftentimes in our common way of thinking, we're actually thinking about prejudice because prejudice is you prejudge somebody based on their characteristics or their perceived characteristics. So anybody can be prejudiced, you know, as a person of color, I could hold prejudice against white people. My understanding of, you know, my understanding of, of racism, I can't be racist towards a white person. And I get a lot of reactions to that because uh, there's this idea like, wait a minute, what do you mean you can't be racist? I can be prejudiced. And that's, this is what I'm saying, the distinction. I feel like we can all be prejudiced, and that's often what we're thinking about. The, the, the race, the ism aspect of it, the racism and, uh, you know, ableism, all of that. It's the system of advantage that the society affords one group over another. 
that sort of makes it a one-two punch. It's the prejudice plus the power. And uh, I know folks like Ibram Kendi have nuances in terms of, and, and I appreciate his work when he focuses on, well, regardless, an action is inher- can inherently be racist no matter who does it. And, and again, that goes back to the system. It, it, can, it will differentially impact certain people in a group when, when, when you participate in something that could be racist or sexist or heterosexist, et cetera. Anyway, that, that's my thought of it. No, great. I actually want to just um, reference the video that Raul was talking about. Dick and Duran Young did a video about, I think it is a little over a year ago. It's on the IFS Institute website about legacy burden. So people can check that out as well. Um, that speaks more about it. And so in regards to the question around isms, and, I mean, individualism and systems, you know, it made me think about like an ecosystem, right? And so even though me as an individual might have my own values and beliefs, I'm impacted by my system, whether it's my family system, my work system, my, you know, community that I live in. And so I think that an individual can have their own beliefs, right? And our own parts that come with our individualized system. And how is the system, the broader system, impact our individual system? Do we allow it to influence us? It has some influence sometimes, whether we want it to or not, right? When you live in a certain community, there's certain choices that are made for you. And there's certain choices you can make, right? You can contribute to. And so I think it's twofold in that individualism, yes, has their own parts and can kind of impact and have action, call, call to action and make certain adjustments and the system because it's bigger and more influenced. And like Raul was saying, power and privilege is real, right? Even if I wanna make a decision as an individual, there's certain things as far as systemically that are going to impact me that I might not have as much control over. And so they can work independently and also work together, particularly I feel like family systems, right? Family systems, it's a system, but also we get to choose, right? The impact when we, when we're children, not so much when we're adults, you know, it, it depends on family dynamics. So I think, the, the answer, if I can kind of be more clear, is that individualism has its own parts and so does the system and they work together. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I'm going to jump into the question on the screen um, for a minute and then we, maybe we can take another question from the virtual audience. Um, so how was my self-awareness journey? Just to jump in that briefly, because this is where IFS was introduced into my life. Um, I, as a client, you know, therapy, having IFS therapy um, really changed my life. And that's how I got to where I am today. That's why I'm so involved with the IFS community, because I feel like it's really a healing model that can impact everybody, regardless of color, you know, um, identified, you know, sexual orientation, um, socioeconomic status. And so, you know, the healing that I've been on has been amazing because I've had this model introduced into my life and I've been able to share it with others, meaning being a program assistant or use it in my own therapy with my clients. And so I love to see how IFS, for me, I've been able to peel the model, the the layers using the model. And so when I think of individualism versus system, I think about how my own healing and my own self-awareness incorporates both my individual choice to go to therapy, but then how the system, how I've continued to walk and I get introduced to different communities different clients, right? So now we're talking about systems and me having different connections based off of a model, which is also a, it's a system because it's part of IFSI, right? That's the creator. Dick Schwartz is the creator of 
IFS. And so I just wanted to share that as far as like, how did I even get here with IFS and what it means for me as far as my own journey? Do we have another question? Well, another one just popped up. It looks like uh, this is a white cis woman saying when talking to white men about racism, uh, I find a part gets triggered. I agree with Rahul. It's a part that feels a lot of shame. How do you calm that part down? What is it protecting? How do you validate that and help the person? Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, this is a white man talking. Okay. Oh, in the white man. Sorry. Okay. I'm. How do you calm that part down? Uh, I think a lot of the... Thank you for that question. Um, when you have a part that's triggered, if possible, acknowledge the part and see if it would be willing to step back in the moment. You know, I know having gone through my own IFS therapy and leading IFS therapy myself, it's easiest to do this in a therapy context. But with practice, I think the idea of, of just saying, I know I have a part of this, but that, that phrase or that mantra, like speak for the part, but not from the part. I think about that a lot when it comes to the isms, because if I have a part that's getting really triggered and somebody's just pissing me off, I can't do a, a, a 180 and, and and I'd be letting that part down if I just said, okay, you're, you're not valid right now or I can't have you jump out right now. But if I'm like, allow me to speak for your anger, but not from your anger, it's helpful. So, you know, forgive my language, but if I was to say, hey, you're being an asshole right now versus... A part of me is really angry at you right now. It's a characteristic difference. And I think there's something to say for honoring your parts that are wounded and are angry and are whatever, you know, um, by speaking for them, not necessarily speaking from them. You can speak from them, but but my experience is, we, you know, uh, that kind of derails often. So that's, that's uh, something that I'd like to share. Great. Thanks, Raul. Maybe the next question we can go to the question that on our slide. Mm -hmm. And okay. as we're doing that, I'm also reading another. Uh, okay. Why don't that, we take our okay. question? Yeah. Why okay. don't we take our question and then we'll go to the um, virtual Sounds audience. Sounds great. All right. So what does healing from isms look like for me personally, interpersonally and professionally? Would you like to take a shot at that, Raul, first, and I can follow up? Actually, um, if you don't mind going first, I have a a, a, a slide that might relate to that um, in a bit. But, okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Sure. So when I think about healing um, from isms, you know, I think personally, you know, <laughs> being a Black woman, um, we've all been part of this pandemic. And we've seen, whether we want to see it or not see it, what is happened to Black men. And so because I'm a Black woman, my father was a Black man, I have a Black son, you know. And so for me, it's about healing for the generations, not just my children, but several generations forward. And what does that look like? For me, it's not living in fear not being judged by the by the color of my skin, the color of their skin. I think particularly for black males, and I'm just gonna be honest, they're the ones who are targeted the most, right? What does healing look like personally for me is for my black son, all the black men I love and who I don't know to be treated like human beings. Not to be pulled over because they're black men and driving. Not to be shot in the middle of the day because they're black. To be able to have the freedom to live like everyone else. And their life not just be taken away because of the color of their skin and the identified gender. 
And I think Tofik, he made a comment about status and power in the opening. And when we've seen all these black men be killed on TV and now it's even worse because now you have video and evidence of murders of people, human beings and people are watching that over and over and over again. How does status and power play into that? Why would somebody even want to look at that? A life being taken because you were driving in the wrong area, according to who? You were driving in a neighborhood on a highway of a community that you live in, that you pay taxes for. So how is it that you were driving in a neighborhood, whether you lived in the neighborhood or not, it's, you know, it's a free highway, it's a free community. How did you go from driving in that community or on that highway to being killed? How does that even equate? That's racism. Period. In my opinion. And personally, what does healing look like? It's for people who look like me to be able to live, <laughs> to be able to have rights and not rights being taken away from them or people not making excuses. I've been in a position where I was sitting next to my partner, a black man and a white police officer just pulled up and pointed a gun in our face. For what? We were parked in a neighborhood that we frequented. Who said that was okay? I didn't have drugs on me. I, didn't, I wasn't doing anything illegal. We were having a conversation in the car. You know, so personally for me, you know, I think <laughs> there's systems that need a lot of healing so that this dynamic does not continue to happen. And I'm just gonna put it out there. It starts with the police. The police systems are wounded. Wounded people wound other people. Wounded people kill other people. And so for me to get to a place that information, consequences, um, you know, pe like again, people who look like me can live in the world freely, interpersonally. How do we communicate about this? Like, this is great. We're having this conversation, talking about it, but talking about it is great. And what are the next steps, right? Are we gonna talk about it and then go do something different when we log off on the web webinar? So interpersonally communicating about it and also doing something about it. And professionally, I think professionally is another avenue because it's not spoken of the harm that is inflicted on people of color in the workplace and how they got to where they did. But professionally, a lot of work being done in companies, diversity and inclusion, and being real about it. Not just, we have a training check mark. What does your workforce look like? What does your management look like? Who's making decisions in your company? And is it done from an authentic place or just to look nice to the face of whomever? Our website looks nice because we look like we're multicultural, but when you get in the company, it's another story. So I'll end with that and wrap and go to you, Raul. Wow, that was really powerful. I, I appreciate that so much. Um... And the, the only thing that I'm thinking in response is as you're talking, racial trauma is such a real and compound reality. And when you're experiencing all of this, how do you experience joy? You know, how do you, how do you experience rest? And it makes me think some of the healing is because there's so much trauma out there, we need to double down and recognize that we deserve rest and we d deserve joy so that that's that's one aspect that i'm thinking about and you know as you can guess this this question and the next question we're about to pop up really is in the title of our talk you know 
So I'm wondering if we can pull up the slide. Um, I have my chai recipe, which I want to share with you, and this comes from my culture. And as before you get too excited, I want to uh, go to the next slide and, and immediately disappoint you and t say that right now I'm talking about an acronym. Don't worry, I, I'll, if we stick around afterwards, I will email you an actual chai recipe because I do make a kick-ass cup of chai. But I do want to talk about these principles that I've reflected on a lot uh, that counterbalance each other. Obviously, compassion, when we think about IFS, it's one of the major C's, right? Humility, uh, this idea that, that, that you know, uh, what is the story I know nothing about, you know, where for, for, for someone else? You know, that phrase, the be kind for everyone's fighting a battle you know nothing about. Can I actually create more capacity to understand where someone else is coming from? Uh, and so respect, I feel like, is a part of that accountability is is the bread and butter of what is my role what is the ways in which i've been impacted by isms especially if i'm holding identities of privilege and what's the work that i need to do so i can help unburden the emotional heavy lifting that other folks have been carrying way too much and the last one is insistence it's recognizing that there's a script and that there's systems of advantage and we need to be insistent. Um, as allies, we need to be insistent on disrupting and interrupting, like I was saying earlier. And as folks who belong to oppressed groups, the insistence is insist on self-respect, insist on uh, being you know, deserving uh, rest and joy. Um, obviously, a lot more I could say about that, but I know we're pressed for time. But, um, but that, that, to me, these counterbalancing principles, I feel like, straddle this idea of, of um, uh, self-awareness, healing, and action. Well, both of you have, have brought a lot for us to think about. Heat and light, as one of the attendees uh, mentioned from Dolly Chuk's book, I, we, we really appreciate your courage for bringing these very difficult conversations to the fore and sharing your personal experiences, which are really enlightening and clarifying for us. Uh, I'd like each of you to maybe give your closing remark and maybe if there's a call to action for each of us and for the rest of the community out there to consider to share those in closing. You want me to go first, Raul? Yeah, or we could rock, paper, scissors it. <laughs> all right i'll jump in there really quick and leave the ending for you um i would say call to action you know i get very passionate about this so you know when i start telling my own experiences and i would say the call to action is for people to i think the parts work is important you know how how do you utilize your parts to make a change. I like what Raul said, disrupt, interrupt, get more knowledge, make the connection, right? How do you utilize the parts that you're aware of to step forward, to change? And not just for that day, but ongoing change, right? The world needs a lot of healing and we've all seen that. And how do we be part of that? one step at a time, one day at a time. Over to you, Raul. Thank you so much. Uh, that last piece that I was sharing, I think insistence, uh, I think insisting that we all belong. If I don't know if we can pull up the this slide that I have, I think it's the second one that, I, that I'd given the foundation. Um, I have a band that I've had the privilege of, of being the founder and, and band leader for. And this, you can see from where, uh, from the picture that we come from many different walks of life, many different backgrounds. And it's a pleasure to be celebrating 25 years with this, these wonderful group of folks. Um, if you go to the next slide, we've not only playing music together, but here we're doing a workshop on inclusive joy. 
where we're teaching them African and Indian and Latin and Brazilian rhythms and into four different rooms. And then we all come back together in the big room and try create what we call the Afro-Indo-Caribbean uh, rhythmic connection. And because I'm a psychologist, then we turn to the next person and we talk about the experience. And then if you go to that, yeah, you can go to the last slide. Where am I getting at with, with all this? I think our take home, and we've demonstrated this with each other, and I think my take home for you is our, the motto of the band is one family, many children, insisting we all belong. Because at the end of the day, I believe that sense of belonging needs to be equally shared. And, you know, to Rakina's earlier point, we have such broken, disparate systems if certain groups of people can't even be uh uh in a you know in in a part of the country or even a neighborhood that they grew up in without th this sense that you know they might get harmed they might get killed they might you know this we are so far away from that universal sense of belonging that shouldn't it be our our number one priority to interpersonally to really insist that we all belong and what does that courage and that action for each one of us look like and what's the stuff that's getting in our own way from 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 enacting that? And that's basically my closing thought. Thank you both so very much. Rahul, you know, it's true to your name and with Rikina, you took us on a journey that we all really have to take. It's, it's an obligation for us to to start with our inner journey to understand how we can hold privilege and oppression at the same time. Uh, and and really flip this the script. I appreciate that challenge, and uh, you gave us a lot to think about and a lot of um, inspiration along the way. So thank you both, and I thank all the participants. And I want to invite.